Good morning. Good to see you today. Thanks for all of you for being with us, and we appreciate all of you who are joining us, either with a live stream or later uh, participating with worship through the video. Welcome to this third Sunday in November. Can you believe it? It's already the third Sunday of November 2020. November 15th, welcome to this worship service today. We greet you in the name of Jesus Christ. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, looking ahead to this week, we hope you can be with us for our men's Bible study on Tuesday morning. That's 730 in the fellowship hall. Our women's circles are meeting, um, or actually did meet, and now they're going to be meeting in December. Sorry about that. That'll be again in December. If you're not connected, if you're a woman in our church, either a member or visiting and would like to get connected with one of our monthly women's circles for Bible study, prayer, and fellowship, Get in touch with us at the, at the church office. You can contact me, Rebecca Banzaff, others in our church. We'd love to get you connected with that ministry. And then join me this week for Wednesday night Bible study at uh, 5.30 in the fellowship hall. And if you can't be with us in person, uh, join us by Zoom. We have an easy connect on the uh, homepage of our website. All you have to do is click that bar, join Wednesday Bible study around 535, 35, and we will connect you in. Uh, love to have you for that, either by video or simply by audio. Uh, so join us for all that. I am excited about everything that God is doing in our church family. And as we move through uh, this penultimate month of the year of COVID, we give thanks that God has sustained us and we are looking ahead to our anniversary year, very special anniversary, bicentennial year in 2021. If you're a member of the church, you've already received your stewardship notes and we are gonna be making bicentennial celebratory gifts and pledges and commitments and RSVP. Um, Janet and all the Bardwell and Love families, we wanna thank you all for the flowers and what a great memorial and recognition. And now I want to invite Reed Robertson Ford. Reed leads our college ministry, university ministry, as well as coordinates our youth. And he's going to lead us in our call to worship today. Would you stand for a call to worship from John 15? Jesus said to his disciples, as the father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, Jesus said. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today uh, for your steadfast love, for your enduring love, that no matter what we do, no matter uh, how we fail, your love is enough to bring us back. Your love is enough to rescue us and your love was so great that you sent your son to die for us so that we could abide in you so that we could be reconciled to you and we ask that you would remind us of that this morning that you would teach us to abide in you this morning to rest in you to live in you and that uh, through your word this morning through the songs that we sing through the prayers that we pray that you would open up our hearts to you, that you would teach us to abide even more deeply in you, and that you would uh, compel us even more strongly to obey you. So we ask that you would bless our gathering this morning, uh, give us wisdom, and give us faith to trust you, and give us hearts that are open uh, to what you have for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now would you be seated and sing with us, Jesus loves me. Thank you.
Good morning. So I'm here again to talk to you more about Operation Christmas Child, which National Collection Week starts this week. Um, I'm in charge of the uh, area drop-off collection site, and it's at Faith Baptist Church, but you don't have to worry about that. You can drop off your shoeboxes here at the church anytime. I spent the weekend wrapping boxes, getting things ready for us, and I'm so excited. But I wanted to remind you why we do these shoe boxes every year, why this is um, something that I'm so passionate about. So in Psalm 41, it tells us, blessed is the one who considers the poor. Now we have, there are a lot of poor people everywhere, but the reason that we focus on children, it says Jesus puts heavenly value on little children. And this is why Samaritan's Purse reaches out to the least of these, to tell them about the love that Jesus has for them. Operation Christmas Child shoebox gifts are the vehicles to get the message to them. These shoe boxes do so much more than just deliver toys. If that's what you're thinking, you're missing the point. I said that last week. You've got to remember, this is how we reach these people. This is how we open their hearts and their minds to Jesus. I wanted to share um, a short story with you this week um, about um, a shoe box that was uh, packed in an American, or actually I should say an English country, because there are actually a few other countries now that do shoe boxes. Um, and it was packed in an English speaking country and it was sent out to who knows where. We don't know where our shoe boxes go when they leave. I know they go to Atlanta, but then from there, they're distributed to all the different places that are in need. And every year it's different places. It's not the same places every year. Most children only receive one shoe box in their lifetime. But um, uh, back in 1995, when this first started, um, there was um, a pastor in Lebanon, not a Christian country, not a Christian nation. And um, he had uh, mentioned that, you know, they could really use um, some, some gifts and things at an orphanage there. Um, and also in a neighboring village um, with some children there that their families really had no way to learn about Jesus because they had no Bibles in their language. So I wanted to read what it says here. Sammy told the family who had expressed interest in a children's Bible for their son. When Sammy went with the team to a Lebanese school, Sammy's the pastor, I should say. This little boy opened his shoebox and found a copy of the Bible in the Arabic language. Can you imagine God directing a family in an English speaking country to put an Arabic Bible in a shoebox, not knowing where it would end up? Then out of 5 million boxes, it was packed, sent to a processing center, sealed, put on a pallet, then shipped in a container across the ocean ending up in Beirut, Lebanon, of all places, and eventually into the hands of this boy. Stories like this confirm that these shoe boxes are tools of God's hand. We pack them and God guides them. I believe more than ever that the Lord knows where each and every box goes. Every year I have people just ask me, well, do we need to put summery things or do we need to put wintery things? I say, God knows. He knows where they're gonna go. He knows where they need to be. You pray about it, you pack these boxes and you turn them in, and then we pray and we let God send them out and worry about where they go to. So I hope that you will consider, if you haven't already, packing a shoebox. Remember, you can also do it online this year. Um, you can just go in, uh, I think it's $25, you enter and it packs your shoebox for you. But um, we just want to make sure that we do our part, especially when we're stuck at home, to spread the gospel to all nations. Um, so I hope that you will take part. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this wonderful, wonderful ministry that Samaritan's Purse does. We thank you so much that especially in this year when we're all kind of confined to our homes or just to our communities, that we have the opportunity to be missionaries. We pack these boxes and then we let them go into the world and share the gospel. I pray, dear God, for the hands that prepare these boxes and I prepare, I pray for the people that will open these boxes. I pray that you would bless these children and in turn, their families and their communities and our world. Dear God, you are master over all and I just pray that you would continue to bless our church and help us to show your love in everything we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand again for the affirmation of faith this morning? From the Shorter Catechism questions 41 and 42. Where is the moral law summarized? 
the moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments. What is the essence of the Ten Commandments? The essence of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all our mind, and to love everyone else as we love ourselves. May be seated. In this month of Thanksgiving, and when uh, faithful members of our church family are considering bringing forward their pledges, not only for service and for worship, but also as part of worship for regular giving, it's a joy uh, to be participating with a lot of ministry planning that flows from uh, our elders in this church, our outreach team, and your hearts for mission. I actually picked up from the mailbox because Cheryl didn't get it out till late, and for some reason the mail didn't pick up yesterday, I guess. Uh, she put it out late Friday. This is a check from you, from First Presbyterian Church, going to support Jeff Kim, our missionary in southern France. I had a great, uh, long Zoom conference with Jeff on Friday morning. I'll tell you more about that next week, but uh, the, the church at Pirelet, um, in the southern part of France is doing great. The renovation has been completed and he is gonna be sending us a video thanking you, thanking First Presbyterian Church for helping make that renovation possible. He asked for our prayers during this season of lockdown. You know, I talked about that with our UK partnership churches last Sunday. Please be praying for these uh, ministry leaders in Europe right now who are seeking to bring revival to what is largely a desert area spiritually and are seeing great growth, but it's a challenge right now during this season. So I wanna ask your prayers for that. I also give thanks that just this past week, we also were able to send, and I'll tell you more about this later too, but you were able to support a new after-school children's literacy program in the state of Bihar, which is in northeastern India. And you are also now online to support yet two more church planters in India. They're not gonna be in Bihar, they're gonna be Presbyterian church planters in the state of Gujarat, which is one of the anti-conversion states in India. In other words, you can be arrested and executed for seeking to convert someone from Jainism or Hinduism uh, or Buddhism uh, or Sikhism to Christian faith. Nevertheless, these bold, faithful Christian church planners are at work in those areas. And we give thanks, I wanna give thanks. We wanna be praying for all of our church planners throughout India and for the two new ones who are gonna be trained for Gujarat in the coming year, as well as this five day a week um, after school program, literacy program that will run throughout the year to reach the poorest of the poor. You wanna talk about the poorest of the poor and you wanna talk about the Operation Christmas Child Ministry is great, but it's a one-time opportunity. This is throughout the year that children might learn to read and learn to read with the Bible. Incredible children who come from all different non-Christian backgrounds. Incredible, hundreds of children in Bihar. Um, a state you've probably never even heard of, but by the way, it's the state that the Buddha originally came from. So you are leaving a large footprint for the mission of Jesus Christ. I wanna give thanks for that as we consider what it really means to love everyone else as we love ourselves. Let's pray together. Holy God, as we come before you today, we give thanks for the excitement and opportunity of worshiping you for the opportunity, Lord, that we have in this next week to give gifts, Lord, that will help support and be a vehicle of ministry and outreach for Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse throughout the world, to places like Lebanon, to places, Lord, even more challenged than Lebanon, where children have no hope, no light, but you will bring light and these gifts will open doors. Lord, we give thanks for ongoing ministry opportunities like those we have with Mission India. Lord, we give thanks for what you are doing with working class French people in Southern France right now, as new families are coming to the Lord right now in, uh, in Pirelat and in St. Paul, Trois Chateaux, in that whole little region of the Rhone Alp area. Lord, we give thanks. What an amazing 
work you are doing, even in a season of lockdown. So we come before you and we rejoice in your good news and the opportunity you give us to be part of a church like this that has a heart for mission, both locally and around the world. Lord, we give thanks for, Lord, the homes that you're building through Habitat for Humanity, and this church is strong support of that, for our outreach with the Salvation Army here locally. And Lord, we, we begin to lift up these in particular prayer requests as we move into the season of Thanksgiving and then Christmas. Thank you, Lord, for the reminders with our, uh, Lord, with our stewardship season, with Operation Christmas Child, that you're calling us to look ahead to be people of grace and giving and the joy of being cheerful participants in your mission. And so we come before you, Lord, we, we rejoice that life and eternal life are a whole lot bigger than our latest test or our latest job to do at home or in a workplace. Those areas are important, but they're simply a stage in which you call us to be witnesses and to be people who are praying far beyond what our immediate issues are with a class in school or, or the latest uh, return on an investment here. Lord, these things will all pass away, but you are eternal and you call us to have hearts for your kingdom, which is eternal. Thank you for that, O oh Lord. And as we come before you, Lord, we continue to pray for those in great need. We certainly pray for these mission workers. We pray for all those involved, Amy and others here locally, and then certainly the international workers with Operation Christmas Child. We pray for the McAfee family, for the Trammell family, and for others, Lord. Lord, bring your strength and comfort to them now. And as we come before you, we pray in the way you teach us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to respond with the doxology. And now, God willing, we have a video from our uh, church choir, our chancel choir, singing again, and we want to provide that to you now.
Amen. And thank the Lord that our technology worked today and we could hear that great anthem from our choir with the word indeed. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you today. We give thanks for your grace in our lives and for the good news that with a word, you said, let there be light, and there was light. With the word, you brought forth all creation. With the word, you called each person here into being, and you know our names. With the word, O oh Lord, we rejoice in your good news, and we pray, Lord, that you would speak to us now. There are all kinds of words flying all around us in this temporal life that we live. Oh, Lord, may you open our hearts and our souls to hear you, because your word is eternal and gives eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, um, we're not actually celebrating either a baptism or the Lord's Supper, but this was the most appropriate place and centering for me to begin this message to you today. I want to talk to you today about love, and I want you to have this visual in front of you as we come before the Word today. Um, I have this little dropper here. Is your understanding of love that, you know, if things go exactly right, we might just get one little drop shared? Just share a little bit. I mean, keep, I mean, keep most in your little container, but maybe a little bit, and maybe if you're, I'm really in a good mood and you're really making me happy, I might drip one more out, maybe just one more. How's that working for you with love? That's the way most people love. That's the way most people actually live out their so-called faith with God, right? <laughs> if things are going just right and it works out just right, I mean, you know, I might drip a little bit of love back to God, just a little bit there. <laughs> Look pretty good to you? Almost can't see it, can you? Um, of course, we got the syringe, you know. Take a lot in, do a little bit out, maybe a little bit more. Maybe this is kind of a little bit more impressive, right? Is that love? Hmm? Hold it up for a while, restrain it totally. Is that love? How's that looking for love? Hmm? I'm busy. Don't bother me. <laughs> I'm over here. Compare that to this. It's all poured in. You know, that's extravagant. I guess some people might call that wasteful because we could have controlled it a lot better with this, right? We could have controlled ourselves and controlled our future, even though, of course, we're all going to die really fast. But hey, we could have held on to things while we might have. This is the way God loves. This is love. God is love. So today, as we come before the Lord, I want you to be thinking about that and having that in your mind. As we come to the, today, the essential valuation that you will make in life, in this brief life here. And it's about love. Real love cost everything. It's not a little drip and a drab and control the rest. Real love costs everything. It puts everything on the line. Now, this begs the question, is love worth it? We each answer that question in relation to a number of temporal things. Okay, that's Basically, I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff we do in life, but probably one of the more important things we do is we decide if we're going to love 
temporal things, and are, are we going to do the little drip, fake, you know, bogus kind of love thing? You, you give me a little bit, I'll give you just a little bit back. Are we going to do that? Or are we actually going to engage in loving temporal things? We answer that question penultimately, really, about is love worth it? Penultimately, you know, the penultimate issue is with other mortal people. Family members, maybe. Other people that God places in our lives. But, but our ultimate answer, not just penultimate, our ultimate answer to this question, it's the answer that really matters. It's the answer that decides life or death for us forever is in relation to eternal almighty God. Is loving God worth it? And do we actually believe that God loves us? So this means what I'm saying is, I, I want to be really clear about this, the essential valuation that you are making right now and you make in your life is all about love. The Bible tells us, this is a staggering message from, from 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. God is love. Let me repeat that. God is love. And, and let me drill down on that and be very clear about what this is not saying, what God's word is not saying. God's word is not saying love is God. Right, There's a huge difference, okay? Do you follow me? God is love, not love is God. There's all kinds of love that is not God, that, that are false gods. You know, appropriately enough, in the ancient Greco-Roman world, Eros was a god, a god who could easily become a demon. Eros, originally in the mythology, was the son of chaos. You can hear where that's coming from, right? Erotic love coming from chaos. But, but then it, it, Eros kind of got, um, you know, a little bit of political correctness, and later he was known as being the son of Aphrodite. Sounds a little bit better, right? But um, we're not talking about Eros. We're, we're not talking about storge, love for family or country that has all, caused all kinds of destruction throughout the world, all kinds of wars and destruction. Horrible things have been not done in the name of love, as, as if love and what we feel is the God, okay? Love is not God. Our versions of love are not God. What we get all passionate about most of the time, our football team or our country or doggone it, that's not love, okay? That's not God. Those are our passions. But what the Bible is saying is God is love, true love. True love that pours out all and that invites us to believe that he's pouring it all out. And that we can trust him totally because a relationship with him is going to be grounded in a full-fledged love and embrace of his love. So 1 John 4.10 says, here, let us define what has just been said in 1 John 4.8, God is love. This is love. Not that we loved God but that God loved us. God poured it out, took the initiative, and gave his son. Gave his son. Did you hear that? Poor, gave his son. Not just offered and not just started negotiating. Gave his son as a propitiation for our sins. Or as Jesus said on the night before, Jesus prepared to pour it out for us on the cross. Well, let's go to look to that. John 15. Turn with me if you have a Bible or you can just listen along. John 15. John 15, verse 13. 
Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. But, but you see, this kind of poured out love calls us into a love relationship. So it makes a huge claim on us. I mean, love, love does cost everything, right? You're either truly loving or, or you're not. There's, there's no in between, right? So if you go back up in Jesus's conversation with his disciples, you look at John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You'll live in my love. You'll remain in my love. Mineo. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide, mineo, remain forever, live in his love. In other words, to be in a love relationship with Jesus, we're going to obey him. Okay? We're going to follow what he says. We're going to trust what he says. We're going to, in other words, not just give him a drip here or there. It's poured out. And I'm not just talking about in our prayers. I'm not just talking about in our stewardship and our giving and our tithing and further offering because we're not legalistically bound. We're, we're set free in Jesus Christ, right? I'm not just talking about in an act of service here or there. It's those, but it's, it's, it's all of those and more. It's an entire life, an entire soul, your soul, your heart, who you are, who I am. Which then, in other words, brings us to the fact that our sermon today is an affirmation and a question. Love, a waste or worth it all? Love, is it a waste to pour it out or is it worth it all? Today, for our primary scriptures, we're going to be turning to two key passages. The, the really central passage is going to be Mark 14, 1 through 11. But let's go back in Mark. Now, as we move, we are rapidly moving towards the conclusion of this sermon series. We've worked our way through pretty much all of Mark. We have a few bits and pieces that we're picking up as we, we conclude this series this month. Mark chapter 10, verses 29 and 30, and then over to our primary scripture, 14, 1 through 11. Jesus said, Amen, truly I say to you, and you've heard this from me scores of times now, when Jesus says, Amen, and I tell you to his disciples, then, and by extension to you and me now, we are supposed to really be paying attention. Amen, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life, eternal life poured out. The one who has poured out to him, it will indeed be poured out forever. And then over to our key central scripture today. Remember, this is Mark 14, 1 and following, the beginning of what is understood to be the passion narrative, what Jesus is. That comes from the Latin passio, uh, to, to endure, what Jesus is going to endure for uh, as the suffering and ultimately crucified Lord. So, so we've turned the page from the Olivet Discourse we're, we're moving through Holy Week rapidly now, and we're looking ahead distinctly to the cross. Mark 14, 1 and following. It was now two days before the Passover, 
and the feast of unleavened bread. The chief priest and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him. They want to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he, as Jesus, was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, of pure, unadulterated, pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why has this ointment been wasted like that? Oh, hey, for this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And amen, I say to you, and truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priest in order to betray, in order to hand Jesus over to them. And when they heard it, they were glad, they rejoiced and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Two days before the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, given Jewish reckoning of time, we're kind of moving around anywhere from Monday through Wednesday, um, likely an evening. It's a feast meal. As I mentioned when I brushed on and, and did a sermon specifically on that verse 9 of this passage a couple weeks ago, um, this is, speaking of penultimate and ultimate, this is Jesus' penultimate meal before he's crucified. The ultimate is the Last Supper in Jerusalem. This is his second to last big meal before he dies. It's two days before Passover. Remember Passover, um, moving from uh, the 14th into the 15th of Nisan begins this, the seven-day slash eight-day festival of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth. They are, they know they want to kill Jesus. They really want to kill Jesus. But Jesus is, even though he's confused a lot of people with all this teaching and not, you know, bringing revolution against the Romans, and, uh, but, but, but he's delighted the crowds. A lot of the crowds we've seen were delighted as he took down the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees in the great debates on Tuesday in the temple precincts. So the crowd loved the way he, he took them all on. And Jesus has followers from Galilee who think he's going to be the Messiah, who's the revolutionary king. He's got folks, pilgrims coming from, you know, other parts of the world and certainly there in Judea. He's got some followers and supporters and some fans as well. So the chief priest and the scribes are worried because... They know they need to kill Jesus. They hate his guts, and they're ready to take him out. But Jerusalem has five times or more the population that it normally does. There's, there's crowds everywhere. How are you going to pull this off? 
And uh, they, they want to do it by stealth. They, they don't want it to be obvious. And on top of that, with the crowds during Passover through unleavened bread for the next week, next week and a half, it's just probably undoable. But hopefully he'll hang around or, or maybe there'll be an opportunity. They are in a little bit of a quandary here, not, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. So you just let that hang. Again, as I've told you, and I've taught you as we move through Mark, Mark likes to use intercalated um, sandwiches, okay? So you got this one piece, and then we got the intercalation going on. Okay, we've got the, the, the main deal coming in, and we're going to come back to the scribes, okay? <laughs> they've got a dilemma. We'll come back to how the dilemma is resolved with the Judas story on the other side of the sandwich, okay? You got the two pieces of bread. Now let's go to the middle, what this is really about, what the gospel is saying to us and calling us to about pouring out of love. And while he, while Jesus was at Bethany, remember Bethany is two miles outside, right? Two miles outside of Jerusalem on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, Jesus' home base when he's in Jerusalem. It's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, presumably a leper that, si that Jesus has healed. So Simon, there's no way Jesus and these folks are, are having a big feast with Simon if he's a leper at this point that Simon would even presume to. So we can kind of infer that most likely Simon is a former leper whom Jesus has healed. So, when do you want to have a feast for Jesus? Absolutely, if you've been healed, right? And he, Jesus, was reclining at table. As he was doing so, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard. Very costly. Now, Mark doesn't use a lot of words a lot of times. He is double underlining this. This is hugely expensive, unadulterated nard or muron myrrh, right, from India. The real thing. This has not been, you know, filtered, fooled with. This is expensive stuff, and a little drop of it would fill an entire house with its scent. So she comes, she comes with a flask of this pure nard, or, or myrrh. Ever heard of myrrh before in the gospel story? Y'all kind of remember the magi with the remember myrrhs for preparation for burial? Remember that from the gospel stories? We, we sing that with one of the hymns too, We Three Kings, right? So um, she comes with nard. And the nard has been put in this alabaster flask the nard is incredibly expensive, and it would have been totally reasonable for her, this woman, to take one little drop. I don't know, maybe if you love Jesus a whole lot, two, three. Because the nard's been put in there. She can open it up. In the same way it's been put in, she can take a little bit out, right? But, but what Mark tells us is that she breaks the flask. There's no going back when you break the flask. There's no going back when you open your heart for real to Jesus. I mean, there's no, there's no going back. She breaks the flask and she pours it over his head. Side note, if we understand that this passage that Mark is kind of giving us a you know, time lapse back from two days before when the scribes are all worried about everything. Um, if this is a little bit of a flashback, then we can easily read this as the same incident that John describes in John chapter 12. And so the woman in John is named as Mary of Bethany, the sister of Lazarus. John chapter 12 tells us they're in Bethany, but doesn't tell us what house they're in. Mark tells us what house they're in. They're in the house of Simon.
And so here she is. Mark wants to really highlight the fact that it's not about her name. It's about what she does. You know, love is not about getting your name put on a plaque, right? It's about the act, the giving, the pouring of love. So there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was this ointment wasted? Exactly. And, and millions and maybe billions of, of Christians through the ages have been critiqued subsequent to this. At least the faithful ones, the ones who have loved Jesus. Why, why, did you, why did you give that much? Why do you keep doing all that stuff for those people who don't care about you? You, you never get any bonuses for, for serving like this. You, you, who, who, who cares if you serve your God that much? You're crazy. It's like you love him more than anything else, more than me, more than us. Exactly. Why was the ointment wasted like that? And now they come up with two concerns that they have. Um, by the way, Mark just Mark is really into only naming Jesus in this story, okay? So he's not even naming Mary. He also is making a really big point not to name who's complaining. Matthew goes on and tells us a little bit more. It's some of the disciples themselves. Are you surprised? <laughs> and then John tells us, if it's the same story from John 12, that actually Judas is leading the charge. The way sometimes Simon Peter leads the charge and speaks for the rest of them. <laughs> in this case, it's Judas, the treasurer, who's really upset. For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii. Again, that is more than a year's wages for a regular working person. You're talking about tens of thousands of dollars being poured out in a moment. And as I said a couple weeks ago, this is likely an heirloom for the woman, Mary, or her dowry. Remember, she doesn't have a living daddy, okay? You got Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus. This most likely is her dowry if she's gonna get married. And she breaks it open and pours the whole thing out on Jesus' head. And according to John, she then anoints Jesus' feet as well. So Judas and the rest are supposedly really concerned about the poor. You buying that? They've been taking any collections lately? <laughs> yeah. So uh, they're really concerned about the poor. This could, have been, um, this could have been sold, and hey, we could have given it to the poor, and they scolded her. And here you get the classic rebuke, rebuke back from Jesus. They're rebuking her, publicly shaming her. I mean, she's, she's taken incredible risk to walk into the middle of this feast and to do this. And they're shaming her, they're scolding her. But let's pick up the story, verse 6. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing. Kalan Ergon, beautiful thing is the strong interpretation or the strong read on that. She has done a beautiful thing for me, to me. And then Jesus says, for you will always have the poor with you. And whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. Amy quoted from Psalm 41 in her children's message this morning. If you're with me on Wednesday night, you already know this. We've dug into this. Psalm 41, which is the ultimate psalm in book one of all those psalms of David after the Beatitude, Psalm 1, uh, the Psalm of the, Messia uh, the Messiah, Psalm 2, and then you have all those 39 psalms of David, right? And the final one, which picks back up a Beatitude, is a beatitude for the one who considers the poor, verse 1. But notice this. What Jesus says, and what he says at the night of the Last Supper is, he's claiming the psalm for himself. It's written, it's written a thousand years earlier by David, David's, uh, Jesus' ancestor, David, King David, after Ahithophel has been so bad and turned against David, right? And verse 9 says, even my friend, the one who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. 
You can read it in John's gospel. Jesus is very explicit. He is claiming this psalm as his psalm. And he's also saying that Judas, that, that David was not just writing about Ahithophel. David was prophesying about what Judas is doing now with the betrayal. Okay? But get this, what Jesus is saying about Psalm 41. Yes, blessed is the one who gives to the poor, pours it out for the poor. And Jesus is saying this, the beatitude is mine. And it is true that this beatitude is generally used and applied to those who give to the poor, alms to the poor, but ultimately I am the one who is giving my life for the poor. And I am the one who am forsaken beyond human understanding. I am the poor and blessed is she, this woman whom you are rebuking because she will receive the eternal blessing of having served me and fulfilling the gospel part of Psalm 41. All that's going on here. She has done what she could. She has done literally what she had. She gave everything, she poured it all out. She has done what she had. That's, that's the literal Greek there. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. So Jesus has already said in verse seven, and we get it now in verse eight, he is once again prophesying, I'm about to die. The hour has come. You read Jesus over in John's gospel saying that, he's saying that right here, and this is the way he's saying it. The hour has come. I need to be anointed for my burial. I'm about to die. And you guys are worrying about money and position and thinking about denying or betraying me. The one person, she may not understand what she's doing, but whom the Father is using to fulfill not only Psalm 41, but all the Hebrew scriptures, all God's word at this moment, at the hour of my death and of your salvation, if you believe in him. She's the one person whom God is using for the gospel that lasts forever. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial because I'm gonna die as a criminal. And when they rip my back to shreds and pierce my hands and feet and let me die like a dog on Golgotha, none of you are gonna be bringing sweet smell to me. She's doing it now. By the Father's will, she is providing. And Amain, I say to you, you all want to be big stuff? James, John, Judas, you're all vying to be the, the guy with the name on the big monuments? Let me tell you something, Jesus says. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done, She doesn't need her name up on a plaque. What she has done will be told in memory of her. And Mark is telling us that this was the trigger, the ultimate trigger for Judas. We don't know how long exactly the sequence is that he stewed on this issue, but he'd had enough. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, you read that over and over again in the Gospels. One of the 12. Can you believe it? One of the 12 apostles. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad. The Greek there can be, they rejoiced. Isn't it interesting what people rejoice about? Hmm? Jesus is about to die. His disciples are a total mess. But the chief priest, and by implication, Satan, are just having a praise party. It's, it's all wonderful. Isn't this great? Now our dilemma has been solved. We can take him in secret because this guy, Judas, is going to indicate the time and the place where the crowds won't be around. And he's going to show us at Gethsemane when there's nobody around, when crowds are all gone how we can take him with stealth. Beautiful. Praise be to our God. 
Now, of course, a couple days later, before Jesus was actually literally handed over, he reclined again at table. And you can read about this in Mark 14 to just carry along with the story here. They're eating, he takes bread, he breaks it, he gives thanks. Verse 23, and he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, I want you to hear this again now. Remember she poured out on him? Verse 24, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's love. God is love. Come to him in your worship, in your giving, and your serving in love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come before you, we ask, Lord, that you would call us to yourself and believe in your love, which is total, extravagant, gracious beyond measure, costly beyond our imagination. But you give it to us, Lord, if we will receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to join in singing our responsive hymn.
And now may he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you his peace, and before you to show you his way. Love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.